Hi there, I'm Dr. Ben Britton. I'm a reader in microscopy and metallurgy uh, in the Department of Materials at Imperial College London. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, using focused iron beams uh, to machine image uh, in samples. So uh, why do we talk about focused iron beam? Uh, first off, if we want to image, uh, we can look at samples uh, using the FIB to, to create secondary electrons and secondary ions, uh, and we can image across samples. Uh, we can also machine objects, uh, so we can either fabricate using sort of bottom-up technology, uh, so additive layer manufacturing in the nanoscale. We can do device edits to correct or change or, or create nanoscale structures, uh, and we can mill structures as well. Um, and so we can cut into objects uh, to create uh, interesting shapes in, in two and three dimensions. Uh, with uh, dual beams, so uh, combined electron ion beam instruments, we can do uh, slice and view to sequentially remove material from the surface uh, and look at each of the slices uh, just before we remove them. Uh, and we can sputter and we can do effectively uh, localized mass spectrometry uh, from those uh, as well. So why would we want to use ions? So ions can be used uh, because they're charged. That has a benefit that we can focus those uh, those probes. Uh, if they're large, heavy ions, they can effectively sputter the surface of the material. Um, we can use a variety of different ions. So gallium is commonly used in a lot of fibs, although we're seeing the increasing use of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, helium, apologies, there should be a HE for this, uh, helium ion microscopes uh, and xenon and other gases. Uh, typically, these have a shorter wavelength due to the de Broglie equation. They have shorter wavelengths than electrons. Um, in the iron matter interactions, they create sputtering, which is really useful. And we'll see some examples where channeling is used. So we can use the, uh, the positive ions. We can focus them uh, into a fine probe. As we sputter, we release ions from the surface of our material. Uh, we also get some embedding of those ions, uh, some implantation, as it's called. Uh, if we use uh, put a charge or carrier gas into here, we can either get gas-assisted etching or we can get selected deposition if we would like. Uh, and in some circumstances, uh, for instance, in biological systems, we can flood uh, with electrons to do charge compensation or neutralization uh, of that surface. So the iron column is set up in a similar manner to the electron microscope. Uh, broadly, you have your focus probe, although now we're producing positive uh, ions uh, through the system as opposed to negative electrons. We have our positive ions, we have an ion source, we have a, a suppressor and an extractor that effectively enable us to balance the probe current off the tip. We have what's called the spray aperture, which effectively chooses the selected probe current that we're going to use uh, for the iron beam current. Uh, and then we have a series of lenses to focus that instrument down towards a point. Uh, then we have another aperture, we have some blanking deflectors and, and effectively beam uh, uh, we can scan the beam later down, but to blank it, we can effectively move the beam onto a lump of material uh, to stop it going down the column. Uh, and then we have a series of uh, effectively uh, lenses and deflection coils to move the beam across the surface of our sample. And so that's what we're going to do down here. So in practice, it looks like this. Uh, so this is sort of strapped on the side of a, of a um, uh, column. Uh, and we'll see this sort of set up. So, so this is the physical reality. This is what the cartoon or ray diagram looks like of that system. Why do we use, uh, for instance, gallium is very common for a fib. Uh, effectively, it's a low melting point material. It will melt in the palm of your hand. That's very useful because you can then use this to wet the surface of a sharp tungsten needle. Uh, and then if you have an extractor electrode, you can effectively rip off ions from that liquid metal and you can replenish from your, uh, your metal source. It's a relatively big ion. This means it has a relatively good sputtering efficiency. It's relatively easy to ionize and so therefore easy to extract. Um, and uh, yeah, and so then we effectively, once we've extracted, we can then do stuff with the ion uh, source later down the column. So once the ion is uh, promoted and shoved uh, down the column, we then effectively get the primary ion going from the vacuum into the solid. So effectively, the uh, implanted ion can do some stuff and it can effectively create secondary electrons from all the iron matter interactions. That's where imaging can be used. We will also get channeling and we'll see where that matters. Uh, we'll get channeling of the ion uh, and that can be important for how deep the ion goes as well as how efficient it sputters the surface. And then you've got this heavy positive ion that can effectively bombard material out of the way. And if you liberate from the sputtering process, you create a hole. 
So the interaction due to channeling is orientation or crystal orientation dependent and material dependent. You can model more formally uh, a variety of these interactions using uh, SRIM, uh, stopping ray of ions in matter code, uh, TRIM, a related code, or molecular dynamics if you care about these things. Uh, the specific interactions will depend on the energy of the ion and the material itself. Um, a, a good cartoon is found in uh, the classic introduction to focused ion beams book. Now, one nice thing and problematic thing is that the sputtering rates of materials is effectively not dependent on atomic number. There are strong variations and broadly it's inversely dependent on uh, the melting temperature. You can see that sort of inverse dependence here. That's useful and not useful, uh, but effectively that's one of the reasons why we, we uh, can get variable sputtering rates uh, that can give us information about the material that we're looking at. Um, if we look at the angle of incidence of our uh, beam on our sample, the material will sputter differently and it will effectively sputter faster at high angle. And that's very important. Uh, we'll use that to our advantage. Uh, very briefly, that's effectively that you're sort of, um, if you imagine that you've got your material, you're sputtering. So if you sputter into the material itself, then effectively it's quite difficult to liberate the ions, whereas it's much easier to sort of slice the side of butter so as you sputter, that material can easily be removed uh, from the side of the object. So the sputtering rate effectively goes up with angle. And of course, it's also Z number dependent of the base material. I mentioned that ion channeling is important. So similar to electrons channeling, this is uh, an idea that if you're, for instance, the idea I use in my head is that if you're looking at a vineyard, so very well planted uh, vines at equispaced, if you look at it down the rows of those uh, vines, you can see very far. If you tilt slightly off angle, you see less far. The same thing happens in a crystalline lattice. This is hugely significant uh, within the FIB uh, bits and pieces. So here are a series of uh, images of iron-induced uh, secondary electrons. And effectively, as we rotate the sample with respect to the primary probe, we can see strong orientation dependent uh, when we're looking at copper and so for instance we see the twins and other grain orientations revealed beautifully in these micrographs this is important because it will change the emission of electrons it will also change the depth of implantation and it changes the sputtering rate so it's really important for both imaging and milling approaches this has huge implications so for instance if you're on axis in silicon so if you're on axis down the 001 peak you can get very beautiful, very sharp edges because you get very efficient liberation uh, and sputtering of your material. If you're not aligned and you're slightly off axis, then you get strong rounding and you get strong redeposition. And so that changes the quality of the, the holes that you're gonna cut. And you can see also the relative depth of the cuts is different between the two orientations. Uh, and that's important if you're trying to cut shapes of specific depths. So you have to be careful to calibrate for the different orientations that you cut into if you care about how far you sectioned into your material. This also gives a, a, it changes the quality of the objects that you're going to cut out of your samples. So you have to be careful if you change crystal orientations. If you develop something for one crystal orientation and you change that, you should check the depth and the quality of the cuts uh, for each of those. This can be useful. So there's uh, some really nice work by uh, Cyril Langlois and colleagues uh, who effectively develop a method to measure the orientation of crystals using ion blocking patterns. Uh, the paper's beautiful to read, but very briefly, they capture a series of uh, maps a different orientation of the crystal. They predict what the expected variation in contrast is with regards to the orientations of the crystals. They match the intensity variations and you can generate an EBSD-like map uh, with about five degrees orientation variation. So really nice. Uh, this was a problem. This is useful in this example. Uh, sorry, change from this is a problem to now this is useful. Uh, but it's also important just to bear in mind uh, more practically uh, for the uh, milling and other operations that you're going to do. Interestingly, though, uh, this you can see the orientation contrast is quite good if you want to say do quick grain size assessment. It can be quite nice for some material systems where other methods like TEM or EBSD would be challenging uh, for, say, size or preparation or other bits and pieces. Uh, an important aspect in, in the FIB is because the probe 
is causing damage and sputtering the material, we've got to care about the shape of the probe. So we cared a little bit about this when we talked about the matching of spot size. This matters especially when you're trying to overlap effectively your pillar drill to make sure that you remove your material nicely. So one method for you to check the probe is to effectively use a pin. So choose, pick a point and just point the beam at that area, point it for a few seconds. You'll then cut a hole and you can measure the roughness and roundness of that hole in the material. This, uh, so as the systems become more sophisticated, it's become a lot easier, but this is important as we then consider trying to remove the material, we have to make sure that we're chipping away or, or milling the material such that we get sufficient overlap of the Gaussian profiles. As I say, most of this is well set up, but if you see that effectively there's a series of isolated points, it's because you've chosen the magnification and overlap incorrect for the raster. Um, and there's a nice uh, description of this uh, in uh, some manuals for this. So we've now focused our probe on our sample. We should consider what happens as the probe instances in our crystal. So effectively, the ion will go into the material and it will scatter. As it scatters, it's a heavy ion and it will knock primary ions of the lattice off their lattice sites. Now you can get those knocked off and such, such that they can effectively be liberated out of the material. And you can also get secondary iron knockoff to get those knocked off. And that's why you'll get a sputtering volume that will be from one primary high energy primary ion. You can get the emission of electrons from near the surface. Uh, effectively, you have a charged particle that can knock off electrons. That's what that will happen. You'll notice also that this will, as it goes into the material, it will uh, knock into the primary atom and scatter multiple sites. Uh, and that will create a cascade of damage through the material. The knocked off uh, ions can also cause damage and you'll get those secondary knock on events. You can create effectively vacancies and uh, point defects, self interstitials, uh, effectively shock, uh, uh, yeah, self interstitial uh, vacancy defects. My brain's gone blank which, which one of those are for the point defect pairs. Um, and that's in the material. Uh, effectively, the distance that this travels is related to, of course, the Z number, the orientation and the energy and size of the primary uh, uh, ion. That's important. We'll discuss that a bit later. So we can cause significant lattice damage. We can create point defects. Now, if you're at a reasonable temperature, these radiation damage associated defects could recombine and you could effectively annihilate such that effectively this uh, self interstitial or you could get diffusion this atom onto this site, and then this could relax into this site. If you do a lot of iron mean damage, uh, you can get effectively organization of all of these point de defects either into vacancy or interstitial loops, so you can create dislocations, radiation-induced dislocations, so prismatic dislocations as they're called. You can also get implantation of the primary ions into the material, uh, and you can get effectively implantation if you say had a surface layer that could be implanted into the material itself. There is also local iron beam heating uh, that's related to the conversion of the kinetic energy into heat uh, and that can cause complications uh, if you're if you do stuff badly you can get uh, heating of your material uh, and that can get it to phase change etc in that the importance of that uh, knock-on volume being proportional to the incoming probe is that if you're going to use the gallium beam to do anything like surface polishing you should make sure that uh, you will get a surface a morphosized layer that is proportional in thickness to the final polishing. So if you have a high voltage, you get a very thick damage layer, 20 nanometers or so, which could be a significant thickness of your final TDM foil. If you reduce the voltage down in steps, you can see that you can reduce that 21 nanometers to two nanometers to less than a nanometer of surface amorphized layer. If you think that you want your TM foil to be 20 to 80 nanometers, uh, that means this is uh, a significant, uh, it's a 1 20th to 1 uh, 80th of your thickness, whereas in this example it's like half your foil thickness, and considering it's two sides of the foil, it could be a significant volume uh, where you have amorphized the material due to the poor sample preparation. So this is why when we do uh, sample preparation, we will often do a low KV final mill to reduce the knock-on damage, reduce the formation of dislocations and interstitials, and reduce the gallium implantation. We note, however, that most FIBs have poorer performance at low KV. 
So we will typically do incremental polishing. So we will do effectively high voltage and then step it down for the final polishing steps. In addition to reduce the polishing damage, we can do this at glancing angles. So if you did direct implantation, it would cause a, a greater penetration depth. Whereas if you did uh, incidental uh, at a high steep angle, um, that will reduce the amount of uh, uh, surface damage as you're sort of lancing away that surface of the material. One important aspect is a focused IMEM instrument is using gallium. Gallium has a phase diagram with many systems. Uh, one in particular that's important to consider is the aluminium gallium phase diagram. This is a big, heavy, uh, gallium is very nice because it's big, heavy, gives a high sputter yield, it's easy to make the tip, but it can react. Uh, this is a classic problem. It's very difficult actually to fly with aluminium because if you put gallium, and you'll see this example in this little GIF, but effectively, if you put gallium on the surface of an aluminium can, it will dissolve along the grain boundaries and brittle the grain boundaries such that just by pushing your finger on the surface of a can, you can crack and break that. So it's important just to consider what will be the phase diagram of your material system so that the sample preparation does not affect what you're going to be looking at in the fib. As you do your uh, milling, what will happen is you will get redeposition. So effectively, as you sputter, some of that sputter yield will effectively redeposit. We can see this redeposition, this 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 redeposition artifact, where we have redeposition of material. Um, as we're sputtering, it will get rejected sideways and will build up this bank of material. Typically, for us to get good quality surfaces, we can do uh, we can control how we do the, the sputtering to give things like control the tilt of the final tilt to effectively just back tilt slightly by one or two degrees to get a near parallel surface. We can use low currents and low KV final cleanup. We can control the milling direction. So effectively, we're going to continually, uh, effectively as we cut, we can cut off to the right and then effectively bring it so we get closer to the fresh surface being the last thing that we mill so that effectively we reject the material sideways. Um, we can control the aspect ratio, the depth, depth to width ratio to reduce the impact of that redeposition. We can also control the uh, currents that we do the milling. Uh, so this is with very high probe currents. We can see there is a much rougher mill uh, and less good surface finish. This is much quicker because there's a higher probe current. So we can effectively improve the quality by, for instance, polishing at a lower probe current and then we could also do perhaps in certain instances a low KV final polish for those. So we just recall that in our iron beam system, we have formed our ion source with our wetted tungsten needle. We have formed this to extract off that. We effectively can control the probe current by balancing the extractor and suppressor. Um, over time, the gallium can oxidize and so there's some balancing. This is why the fib tip may need to be changed occasionally. It's effectively because the source no longer wets effectively. Uh, we can then effectively control the um, uh, probe current by changing the spray aperture in the system uh, and we can change the final aperture down here. There are a series of lenses that alignments etc will need to be done. Often these are automated or we can ask the facility managers to assist if we think things are misaligned. Now the apertures, of course, you have this sputtering material uh, going through the system. These are made of metal. Often they're made of a radiation, uh, something like uh, molybdenum or tungsten apertures. So they're resistant to sputtering, but they do sputter with time. So specifically, these will change shape with time. And so we've repeatedly changed the aperture strip uh, if the probe currents uh, will get larger over time as the holes get bigger. So we control the, the fine final probe current with apertures after we've effectively condensed and focused the probe before that. Uh, we can then effectively blank deflect and then we can do the second deflection to scan across the sample as we want to raster it. Uh, we can see this in the raster scanning, blanking, etc. of the lens system down the bottom. Now in a dual beam instrument, we will have uh, effectively, well, in an instrument, we have a variety of points of interest. So the first off is the eucentric point. So very briefly, so the eucentric point is that effectively we have in our thing, we're going to tilt. The eucentric point is the position that remains constant with respect to our stage as we tilt it. 
So we can see if I if I tilted and had this as eucentric, my middle knuckle, hopefully you can just about see I'm keeping that steady. That's my eucentric point. If I've got my uh, two beams, for instance, in a jewelry instrument, I will have a second point, which is called the coincident point. So that's where the, the coincidence of the electron beam and the iron beam are coincident. So in some instruments, Zeiss instruments, for instance, you can select where you would like the uh, the eucentric point. There's a secondary stage that means you can move the sample around and change that eucentric. Uh, and you can divorce these eucentric from the coincident of Thermo Fisher or FEI instruments, uh, same manufacturer. Um, they're often fixed that the coincident point and the eucentric points are actually the same location in the microscope. The other, due to patterns, etc., just to note that the angle between the fib column and the sem column can change. So they're often 52 or 54 degrees, depending on the particular instrument that you're working with. So uh, we can notice these things. If in doubt, ask the people who are training you for the first. Uh, do not assume it's the same between manufacturers. And, and I think just yeah, check on the columns that you're working on. Um, so within our microscopes, we can do two operations. So the traditional that I've shown you is related to the machining operation. So you can use the iron beams to cut into your samples. Uh, you can also do, uh, you can add a gas for some microscopes. You can use a, a gas that if your material reacts particularly well. So I think water, for instance, can assist etching on certain samples. You can add a, a very fine mist of water into the microscope, a very, very fine mist. Uh, and that can effectively reduce redeposition and increase the etching rate. The other thing you can do is effectively deposit to do this sort of additive layer by layer manufacturing. And effectively you add a precursor gas that the gallium will sputter and break down and release an organic metallic thin film on the surface. And that can enable you, for instance, to do electrical contacts or create three dimensional structures in your material. Do note that although, for instance, you may think you have a platinum gas, it's not a pure metal. So it's a platinum uh, carbon and so that can change the electrical uh, structure of that material. So the precursor gas is flooded across the surface of your sample. You then use the focused uh, electron or ion probe uh, to effectively break down this uh, gas. So often we will do things like platinum coating or carbon coating or gold coating, uh, tungsten coating, depending on what the system set up with. Uh, and we can also do the gas enhancing uh, etching if we change this. Um, specifically, you have to balance the amount of gas that's present with the current. Again, most software will let you do this well, but you need to be careful about how you then do the raster scanning. And uh, typically you'll do, for instance, if you're doing uh, carbon deposition, you will do this with the gallium beam. So you'll do gallium enhanced uh, deposition. But do note that the ion beam will also crack it so you can get actually electron beam uh, induced deposition. Also note that if you do not have enough gas and you have too much uh, probe, then effectively you can etch below and you will restrict the deposition that you have. Similarly, if you have too much gas and not enough uh, oomph, you're wasting the gas uh, in the system. So you want to effectively balance the, uh, the gas and area to control the deposition rates. You can also use the electron beam deposition. This is very slow in comparison, but significantly less damage. And this can be important if, for instance, you're doing semiconductor work. Do you recall it's not a pure metal uh, deposition due to the pre -gas, precursor gas composition in the system? This is uh, useful. Uh, for instance, the, uh, we've uh, discussed this briefly in terms of making shapes. But one of the things you can do is you can effectively add this amorphous constant composition material to effectively protect the top surface. It restricts gallium implantation on the region that you want, and it also reduces what we call curtaining artifacts. That's if there is a variable radiation hardness material that would create a small hole or void that would then effectively create a waterfall of damage down the sample and restrict the flatness of the cleaned region that you have. To do cross-sectioning, what you effectively do is you'll deposit on the region that you like, and then you'll repeatedly mill and slice to go into that material. And you'll effectively try and uh, get it so you can get a nice clean cross-section of the different layers that you want. Uh, and then you can, if you get this deep enough and the correct aspect ratios, you can tilt to look, or you can look directly with the electron beam at those cross-section regions. 
if you do this uh, repeatedly, and so one area of study that we do in the department is we do slice and view. So slice and view, we effectively sequentially remove layers. Uh, we specifically treat the domain such that we can get fast and clean milling of each successive layer with a controlled thickness. Uh, we will then image the surface. We will then slice, we will image, we will slice, we will image. By sequentially uh, moving through the slicing direction, we can build up our three-dimensional image map. This is only useful if you do something with that three-dimensional data stack. Uh, and so the important aspect is you then have to effectively segment to label your three-dimensional microstructure. And then you can do something like volume reconstruction. Uh, we have software tools like Aviso that enable this to be done. Uh, there are other software tools, of course, available. Importantly, this step is a pain to do, but it's relatively easy. It's quite expensive in microscope time. Uh, this is expensive on your time because getting the imaging to behave itself and segmentation to work is very complicated. And you have to make sure that the three-dimensional information is of value. Uh, there's examples. Uh, uh, and I will just show this one. See whether my links behave. Probably not. So a slice and view example. Oh, not a slice and view. Apologies. This is uh, just cutting in to make a shape. <clears throat> All right. A definite example, this is from Dr. Angela Good, who uh, used to be a postdoc and PhD student in the department. Uh, so she was working on biological systems to look at uh, cells and looking at the container wear debris from metal and metal hip prostheses. So in this image, uh, I think uh, if I can get it to show, um, what we will see is effectively the uh, reconstruction in a viso to show that slicing and looking at the image stacks. Uh, and then what's really neat is Angela effectively segmented the two structures to give you access to the uh, deposition of the particles and effectively labeling preferentially of those features through the stack. And then through effectively choosing the appropriate view frames, you can look at how they are connected in three dimensions between slices. So again, a few views to give you a flavor of what this microstructure looks like in three dimensions. This took a lot of effort, and here's a segmentation of uh, different particles and fibrils through here. This took her of the order of about three months, I think, to do the reconstructions. A second example is looking at collagen fibrils in a lymph node. Uh, so here effectively is a, an overview micrograph, uh, the TM, so these are the fibrils uh, through the conduit. Uh, you've got collagen fibrils, uh, here's the TM cross-section. In the fib, effectively, we've got, again, that repeat slicing. So these are the images as you slice through the stack. You can see, effectively, those fibrils and these overall structures going in and out of view as you slice through the tomogram. These are then aligned. You can get them uh, beautifully showing up in the alignment. Uh, the frame's moving slightly just because, effectively, the sample's moved and it's been registered to sit on top of each other. So this is quite a lot of work to give you a flavor and then lots of like sitting and looking at through those image slices. Um, then effectively, if we just focus on the segmentation of the collagen fibrils, this is effectively now black white segmented using a semi automated algorithm to identify those features and label them. This is now looking at a relatively small domain within that micrograph. And then effectively visualizing through that 3D stack, we can now see the segmentation black to white we can then connect up those labeled domains through the slices, and this enables us to reconstruct the fibril structure in three dimensions. So we'll see in a moment that the system will rotate, and we can now see that domain structure showing beautifully through the structure. Now, again, it's important that you have a purpose of why you want to do this, because this took of the order of three to six months to do this single reconstruction. So it's pretty complicated to get this working, but the quality of the results can be very useful and insightful if you have the correct problem to look at. Uh, within your experiments, you can also do machining, so you can cut shapes. This is the video that I showed by accident, but the machining will cut shapes uh, through sculpting the surface. You have to worry about the redeposition, surface damage, and cleanup, but it's useful for TEM lamella preparation. Micropillars and atom probe needles are common application areas. 
Uh, so this is some work that I did uh, looking at nickel superalloy pillars. Uh, this effectively is cutting a mechanical object where we have a single crystal test specimen uh, that was very useful for mechanical testing. Uh, another example is creating a fib lamella from a site-specific region that has a constant thickness. So what we do effectively is we can cut out cross sections from the top and the bottom. We can cut out a thin region. You'll see the operations in a second. We can then get it to be beautifully thin and stuck on a post that we can then put in the TEM. So this example uh, is a really nice video from uh, Tescan showing the operation steps. Oh, it's now disappeared from this, uh, maybe not. I will find and share the video uh, with this. To summarize where we've got to is that in FIB, uh, we've got iron beam interacting with surface. Uh, we can sputter away the surface. The uh, iron beam uh, effectively is orientation and sputtering rates are very important for the material system. Uh, the geometry of the system can be exploited. Uh, there's a significant range of application areas, uh, so we can get a slice and view. Uh, we can do uh, 10 lamella prep. Uh, we can micro machine samples. We can 3D, pr 3D print samples. Uh, a whole range of applications uh, that we want to use this. It's now a very universal technique uh, and approach. Uh, the one other important area is that uh, we can also, uh, within characterization, we can use the uh, this, the sputtered material to do mess spectrometry uh, and this is the basis of FIB sims uh, and there's a variety of developments in the department uh, so we used to have a, a FIB 200 instrument to do positive negative ion mass spectrometry uh, there's a new uh, technique being developed using uh, multiple ion uh, probe sources for this the uh, cons of this is that effectively the localized probe can give you significant variations in sputter rates that can be challenging um, uh, sorry, that can be good because it's localized. It gives you very good light element resolution. It's very surface sensitive. The variable milling rates, effectively, where did you get the samples from? It's relatively slow. You get access to small volumes. Uh, you get variable iron yield and detection depending on the instrument setup. So you want to be very careful with all the uh, the calibration of the system. Uh, with that, I strongly recommend you have a look at a couple of references. So the introduction to focused iron beam. This will also talk through the TEM prep uh, that I haven't shown in the video. Uh, I'm sorry about that one. Uh, and then also there's a whole range of stuff from uh, Enyao in terms of the focused iron beam systems, basics of applications. Uh, with that, uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we've got the Q&A session. Um, I'll hopefully have the uh, a video of the TEM prep uh, set up uh, to share for that.